I'm the chair of the Leadership Studies Department, also a faculty member, and uh, we, are, we are so thrilled that you're here today to join in this uh, special presentation by one of our Leadership Studies friends. Um, that friend is, is uh, Omer Voss, Jr. We call him Hap. <laughs> And he said that he, he doesn't mind Hap or Omer, so you can refer to him either way. Um, Hap is joining us today here from San Francisco, California. He had a, a long, wonderful career with the Bank of America. Um, but he has more connections to Fort Hayes than just that. Uh, his family, including his parents, Omer and Annabelle, and his sister, uh, have given gifts to Fort Hayes State University Fort Hayes State University to create the endowed professorship that Kurt Brungart holds, as well as a new program that we are just unveiling today called VALUE, the Voss Advanced Leadership Undergraduate Experience. And many of you in the room are taking part in that experience the next academic year. So Hap or Omer is here today to uh, talk a little bit about his family's legacy, talk about his experiences, and to talk a little bit about his philosophy of leadership. This morning at 9 o'clock, we had a press conference, and at that press conference, we unveiled the VALUE program, introduced the program to the campus and the community, as well as introduced the students. And you spoke. And one of the things that he said during his speech was, he believes that leading or leadership begins at the edge of your comfort zone. And so I think he's going to share a little bit more about that philosophy today as well as some of his great experiences that he's had both in his career and with his family. I would encourage you to put your cell phones away and turn your ears on and take good notes uh, because Omer Voss has a tremendous amount of knowledge and experience to share. So welcome to you. And uh, one thing he wanted me to note is that he is he's willing to take questions throughout his presentation. So if you have a question, don't feel like you need to wait until the end. Just raise your hand, and uh, he'll answer that question as best as he possibly can. So welcome to Fort Hayes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. Uh, first, a show of hands, who was at the presentation this morning? Oh, so some of you. Well, that's good. And also good that a lot weren't, so if I repeat, you know, forgive me, forgive me. Um, that uh, note of outside the comfort zone, um, Neil Walsh, I, I didn't come up with that, Neil Walsh did, said life begins at the end of your edge of your comfort zone. I changed that to be leading begins at the edge of your comfort zone. And frankly, just being here today, is at the edge of my comfort zone. Um, flying in, getting here on time, check out the place, all those things. I wanted to feel comfortable, don't we all? Well, sometimes you don't have time to get comfortable. I don't have any magic bullets and magic words to say, but I'll certainly try to tell you what some of my experiences have been, and maybe I might even focus on sales a little bit. And when you're out there one-on-one, -on -one, or one on many, you're selling. But first, who, who are these people? We've been talking about them, and, and this wasn't a memorial by any means. It's a living uh, legacy, so to speak. For scholarships, they started in 61, when Dad made the commencement speech out here. And I mentioned most of you weren't, or your parents weren't even glimmers in your grandparents' eyes about that time. But the the experience there and the ties, long and the short, they started as a scholarship and they grew that into two different scholarship funds. They've uh, donated to various initiatives, including the um, distinguished Voss professor, Kurt Brungart. And he's done wonders with that program and that uh, title, so to speak. But the point is, well, who are these people? And what I like to do is just do a brief look-see, explain a few things that you'll see on the screen. There's, there's no words to write down and, and so forth. Um, and then I'll, I'll relate to or try to summarize what some of those things meant. You know, what, and while we're, we're, well, at least while I'm talking, I mentioned in the speech that I would like, uh, one of the things Dad had said was that debate gave him great experience for the future. 
So while we're going through this, think a little bit about why that would be. He coached debate. He was a debater at Hayes and then at KU Law School. Um, think about what those traits would be of a debater. You're sort of up there in front of God and everybody. So what does that mean? Very much like leadership. What does that mean? You know, I said, uh, as others have said, dig down deep. Well, just sort of extend that a little bit. Well, first off, we had, <laughs> there we go. It was him around later Hayes time, and that when they set up the distinguished leadership, was mother and mother later on, Annabelle. Um, what one little thing here, this pin is the Southern Cross because they started out overseas uh, once, if you will, management got going in dad's career. And Australia was a big step in 1950. <laughs> if you can only imagine, the grandparents didn't even know where Australia was. And their kids are going there and they're taking the family. Just stepping outside of that comfort zone, what does it take to do? I can do that. Believe me, they thought about it a long time. I saw some of the letters they wrote. But the point is, you just do it. So if we can maybe slip over to the OGV bio, yep. And we'll just scroll down a little bit. Just a couple of the pictures that are in here. The uh, value students, the 10 of them received the bios. So all I want to do here is just recap a couple of those things. Yeah, I, the horseshoes. That was taken out of the, was it the uh, Fort Hayes, was it Reveille? Was that what, it, what it's still called? Okay, that was right out of there. And um, this was with Hammond and Kurt and, and him is uh, in 87, or at 87. And we'll flip on down, we won't read text and such. Uh, Army was in the Army Air Corps, was in the Air Force then. I mean, we're going history here, okay? <laughs> and he was a non-com, but he was the fastest typist, as uh, the, some of those uh, in the, the, this morning had said. Uh, you heard Tim say, he challenged 135 words a minute, no errors. And that served him well later, typing up his, his uh, customer reports. He was on credit and collections for Harvester. Uh, this was Australia, as we were leaving Australia. Yeah, that little brat's me. My sister and then the t the, uh, them. Um, that was a big deal, but it also, we'll talk a little later, how that affected me, maybe. And this was in England. The guy he's talking to here. Is any, anybody know who that might be? I'm on scholars of geography here and world. That's Prince Philip. You know, the, the all, all but king in England, obviously the husband of the queen. Um, they were actually about the same age. And it's a sort of thing here. This was 1950. Okay, well, he wasn't 40 yet. And he's talking and leading and doing and... How do you just jump into those things? Well, you sort of do it, yeah, part of the job. But do you have the confidence to say, well, what do you say to a guy like that? <laughs> anyway, um, this is, again, just to give you the flavor. This was signing uh, in USSR. This was, as uh, Tim had mentioned, when Kissinger couldn't get there, Voss could. This was the first deal that was ever done in the Cold War, so to speak. Uh, with Russia, and when they were there, they had to step out on a balcony behind like four locked doors, talking to a minister, just to sort of huddle a bit because they're overheard everywhere. It was literally being spied on. So that kind of an experience signing this agreement, it was, I think at the time, $100 million deal for crawler tractors to build the pipeline. That was uh, speaking French. Um, very little puh <laughs> in uh, Quebec and making other speeches around. This is with Kissinger, Gerald Ford. So I say, well, how did that happen? That was all late in the career. No, it wasn't so late in the career. But just having the leadership presence to talk to people 
and to figure these things out, to be global enough to, to talk about issues that related to the people you're talking to. What do you say to a Kissinger or any president for that matter? Um, let's see, I'm not sure we, well, I mentioned the Hall of Fame for 4-H. Any 4-Hers in the room? Well, good, good. The old, is it I am a 4-H or I do 4-H? Uh, I am 4-H. You don't just do it, you live it. Well, he wasn't in 4-H, but he did an awful lot with them. He was their founding chairman in the 1970s when they combined the old service groups and so forth together. Point was, he took a leadership role, and then they picked him. So are you picked for leadership? Or do you step up and say, I can lead? Well, depends on that situation, doesn't it? And we don't have a whole lot more here, but good timing. Kurt walks in a room, and here he comes. Um, and this was uh, at the, the prior event in 2004 when it was announced. And if we just scroll up a little bit more, and here, not to boast per se, but the point is these are logos of the organizations that he was either a chairman or president or director of. A lot of boards, a lot of banks, a lot of companies, but you get down into other things. It wasn't just all that business. Evangelical Lutheran Church, we'll talk a little about that. They gave a lot of money there. Um, American Red Cross, he was uh, chairman of the VETS group or committee. Commercial Club of Chicago, yes, some things you're picked for, but others, you know, you just do. And let's see what else was on here on this one. The, the Cornerstone, this was a wonderful tribute to him. Um, I encourage you just to read it because I'm not going to go too much more into their, their history. But I want to give you a feel for these kinds of things, and then we'll, we'll absolutely talk more. And I think that's probably it for him. If we can pip over to Mothers. It was a two-people team here. You know, if, <clears throat> excuse me. Dad was out there, fine, go earn the living. Mother was the housewife. But think about this. When you go overseas, and we can slip up a little bit more now. And what did we? Is it tools? Just get, tools, get rid of it maybe? Okay, that's, that's fine. Point is, we just want to get a, a little bit, again, a feel for what it was all about. Um, in these, these pictures, the point is, she was with him. This happened to be on the Queen Mary, gussied up, do whatever. That wasn't just to be on the Queen Mary and gussied up. They were on a business event in Egypt. Oh, whoopee, we get to go on tours and such. Uh-uh. This was opening up new markets. When Dad ran the British company at a young and tender age, he spent a lot of time on the road. I didn't see him an awful lot. He was in Egypt. He was in Greece. He was in Turkey. He was in Iran. He was in, or at the time it was Persia. He was in Iraq, India, Calcutta, armpit of the world, doing deals, opening up distributorships, licensing people, and yes, mother was there too. Oh, she was having a vacation with this, wasn't she? Nah, uh-uh. She was there to check out the wives. This was business. You know, it's a little mm, different these days, and that may not sound totally politically correct, but that's the way it worked. And in cultures, adjusting to cultures, learning what you don't, don't touch people with the right or left hand, all those kinds of things, there's a lot to learn when you're a leader because everybody's watching you. Not waiting for you to fail, but just, well, hey, did you see what Voss did? Well, I gotta be careful when I'm here. You're out there, I'm here, you're, you're looking at me. Anytime you're up speaking to folks, and this was unscripted here, believe me. I got to write a speech for the other, and I'm talking to Jill saying, 
Now, what's this going to be? Well, it's Q&A. Just tell them about yourself. Now, that's boring. <laughs> Who are these people we're talking about? And why? You know, the reason I'm, I'm throwing these up here is to show, yep, in India, in Greece. But look at this. It was nasty and hot there. Business suit, proper attire, leader role, those kinds of things, especially in those days. He didn't roll in in a, a, a sweatshirt to talk to a dealership or a prince. I mean, you just didn't. This is how it was done. And even today, you have to have that respect because you're meeting other leaders. Okay. Um, just sort of rolling right on through here. You know, mother was along, but this happened to be with, if you ever heard of Shirley Temple or Shirley Temple Black, she was appointed an ambassador, and here's mother introducing her. Um, she had to fill a role, too. And further on, one of those things in leadership, I'll, I'll take a minute here, personal one. This young lady was a Hungarian refugee. This was 1956. So I was 10 years old. Okay, I'm giving up secrets here. Um, this made a tremendous impression on me because someone they knew in Australia called and said, I got this young lady, she was 21 at the time, and I want to set her up to live with you all. Can you take her in? Huh? <laughs> a little before Christmas, uh, you know, the Hungarian Revolution was in October of 56, by the way. And so she had thrown Molotov cocktails. She had worked in, in uh, Budapest and escaped, running through minefield chased by dogs. And here she is, she can't speak English, and a family takes her in. Well, she grew up, this was her daughter, this was Annabelle Jr., I would say. Um, that was Kati and my parents. The point here is you can do leadership in a lot of ways. He brought her into the company, gave her a job, and she was the best typist, assistant, etc. and yet she had never spoken English. She stepped up to what he had given her, that opportunity to to lead in that own way, to set an example for other refugees. Okay, I won't dwell on this. Australia, doing stuff. When we got to Australia, that's yeah, me and my sister, bread was delivered in horse cart. The old days. Australia isn't really that backward. Um, and let's see. Well, this was the kids and the family members. We can roll right on. A cuter picture here, Australia. They made a cute couple, didn't they? Uh, we were leaving Australia at this time. Okay, and this one I love. When you think about stepping beyond your comfort zone, okay, she looks sort of like she was born to this, right? Uh-uh. She had two blouses, two skirts when she went to Colorado University. She worked the switchboard to get through school. She met Pop there and so on and so on and so on. They, they had four dates and the fifth one they got married in California. Okay, next thing you know, they're off to Australia. She had never had a dress, a ball gown. She got somebody to mentor her to take her out to buy a ball gown. And it was a beautiful one. I remember it to this day. However, at, at the Coral Sea Ball, they said, will you please get up with the band and have a picture? Good grief. I mean, the Coral Sea Ball was the event in Melbourne, believe me. Ambassadors were there, everything. OK, on one condition, that the boys in the band get the picture. OK, in her own way, sort of including, being inclusive, all that. She was furious the next day on the front page of the Melbourne paper. There she was. No boys. I was just a wee tyke. I remember her screaming at the phone at these people for what they did. Okay? The point here is make your voice heard. They printed a retraction later, by the way. And they did run the full picture. But that point is stepping outside of your comfort zone. How do you do that? Well, you ask, ask questions, and then go do it, okay? 
And we'll roll right through here. It's using up a lot of time here. The happy couple, wedding day, and so forth. Um, with, with sort of with that background, you've seen some of those, those tales of the family. And the point here is how much you can do if you just set your mind to it when somebody picks you. Okay, they were picked to go overseas. What do you do when someone picks you? Do you think, oh gosh, can I do that? Uh, maybe. Do you step outside the comfort zone? Well, maybe. What, let me do a little, I've been rattling on here. What are some of the words that go into or you think of in leadership? You guys have been studying this stuff. I never had a leadership class. And maybe it shows. However, what are, what are adjectives? What are characteristics? Just throw up some hands or sing out some words. And come on, yeah, please. Responsible, responsibility, and taking responsibility. Yeah. Working with people, absolutely working with them, and managing at some point, maybe, or leading them. Motivation, you being motivated to succeed or to do something. How about motivating other people? Please. Courage, thank you. Very good. Dig deep down. Courage and commitment and what else? I got a lot of words written down here. I've heard a few of them. Guts and courage, good, yep. Open communication, very true. And talk with your people and with your bosses and your mentors. Go find mentors in a company or whatever organization. Be open-minded and flexible. Yeah, because you'll cut, get cut off at the knees if you're not. Get your facts. Passionate. Have passion for something. Enthusiasm. Visionary. Oh, we're getting up there, aren't we? <laughs> No, but that's, that's true at different levels. Have a vision of your own career. Big picture. Very true, too. At that leader level, do you have that when you're down at this level? Yeah, you better have it so you can practice it. Yeah. Strive towards a common goal with others. The team, how to be part of the team, or how to lead the team. How do you? Put your hand up. You do it. I can do that, you know, if you're in one of those meetings. That's where I had problems at first. And some of you heard my confession, so to speak, in the, this morning. The uh, point was, I, I didn't know how to implement something. Hey, I, I knew what should be done because I was great at case studies. It's easy in the classroom. But how do you step out there and do it? You don't know half these people. You don't know half the people you're going to have to talk to. And these days, it was a, <clears throat> excuse me, a challenge for me at Bank of America, Global Bank, taking an initiative and just figuring out, well, who do you talk to? I started out at a smaller bank, mostly in Chicago. That was easy. You went up two floors and you found them. How do you do it when you got a talk to somebody in Asia or London and get them on a conference call. And especially when we didn't have a lot of the technology we have today too. How do you train people? I, one of the things that I was able to do, I was fortunate, I was picked for things that never existed. Systems that weren't existed or a job that wasn't ever done before. A couple of them I stepped up for, others I got picked. And I don't know why, they set me up to fail. <laughs> Did I make enemies? I don't know. But it took, frankly, it took some guts and a couple more of those, um, the words, what, uh, we had vision, ethics. I like ethics. 
We don't have a lot of ethics, it seems, these days in some leaders. But I think that's certainly their personality, charisma, tenacity, humility. Be savvy. Be clever. Get your facts. Prepare. One of the things that, that uh, Tim and, and Ed Hammond, previously the president, had said at one point about Pop, he was the most prepared person they ever met. Gets back to debate. What are a couple of those debate traits? You don't have to necessarily have vision, but what would be some of those traits as a debater, not just leader? Yeah. Confidence, yep. Knowledge, get your facts. Know both sides, be prepared. You know, light on your feet. All, I mean, th these are behavioral things. And I mean, I never went into banking thinking, or the MBA or whatever, thinking I'd be a banker. And I really wasn't a banker. I wasn't an investment banker. Uh, that wasn't on the list. I was in sales or consulting, helping people. I liked helping people. I guess that was what triggered a lot in mine. In sales, you're helping your client. Have you ever gotten into one of these, um, this isn't one of those gems of wisdom, but if you're talking to a client or working with a group that you don't really know much about, how do you get to know what they need? You're trying to sell them something. Think about that. How do you get to know what they need? I mean, simple stuff. Hands? Observation? Take an interest? How do you know what they want? If you ask them the question. Absolutely. Ask, ask, ask. There's a, an old diagram, I don't have one, but it's a spiral. And the client's in the middle. And you're on the outside. When you ask questions of that client, it's easy to say, oh, they gave you an answer. Let's go jump on that one, right? Oh, I can take that. I've got all these benefits of this product you can use, and it's great for you. You're, you're the leader in front of that client. Don't fall into that trap. Go into the center and then come back out to the edge. Ask some more questions about this. Maybe even get to know about their boss. What's the structure? Who's the accounting department? You're selling to the treasurer. Does he ever interact with them? Yeah. What if, what if you did this and then you didn't have a problem with accounting? Could this be a problem? What if you don't do it? Will accounting be mad at you? Make them feel the pain. There is a pleasure pain part to this. But find out about those points first. Stay, stay back and, and then come in and ask, OK? That, that kind of a, it, it's a behavioral thing, but it's training. And they'll, they'll put you through that in a sales class. And role plays. Think up questions on your feet. You know, be, be quick about it. Um, a couple of the things that came up just as a little bit of humor, maybe. I was also a consultant, so we wrote studies for people. Cash management studies, treasury studies. How to sit on their cash, get it in faster, sit on it, slow it going out. Okay. So you write all these things up. On the cover of one, it was for Amalgamated Sugar Company out of Utah. Okay, we write up the study. On the front page it says Amalgated Sugar with their little logo. They didn't like that. I'm presenting something to them, first time to the CFO, I've met the treasurer before, and who points that out? The CFO does. Knock the leader off his feet. Be prepared, do your homework, that kind of thing. It's a life lesson, believe me, when you're embarrassed. And you try to sell all your points after that, you've lost your credibility. Check your facts. It's pretty simple. I did another one for Rand McNally, you know, the, the old map people. Now, naturally, it said, we are delighted to provide this study for the Rank McNally Company. 
Oh, God, we did it again. Where's that proofreader? They failed me, their leader, in that sense. Yeah, I raised hell with them when I got back. Didn't help in the meeting, but that was a mentoring opportunity for that person and for me to provide feedback. Okay, um, I got notes all over the place here, and that's not what we wanted to do here. What, what kinds of leadership are there? How many different kinds of leadership? Uh, corporate leadership, I'll start you off. What other kinds of leadership? Okay. Community leadership, exactly. All kinds of positions in the community. Other? Uh, risk leadership in... Because there are risk managers, too, physically as a position. Absolutely. Political leadership. Now you've, you've gone through all of these kinds of roles and probably write-ups about all of those. But in doing some of these things, how do you, I mean, do you perceive this at an entry level or at... The CEO level, mentioned vision before. You know, how do you do these things when you first get in there? If you're implementing a program, I took out the organizational chart. That's pretty simple, pretty stupid in a way, but yeah, take it out. Look at the names, learn the names. Who report to those people? How do you implement something? When I had Folks come in as analysts, training analysts. I give them the, you know, here's the phone list. Here's all, everybody's name and their number on the floor. And I go back two days later and ask them, well, who's so-and-so? Where, where do they work? Oh, I don't know. Am I supposed to learn this? Oh, yeah. Uh, pay attention to the facts that you get an opportunity right when from day one. Just get in there. I mean, little, little things. I mean, this isn't rocket science. It's behavioral stuff. Um, in the value program, and I'll call on value students, and the rest of everybody, too. What's an important part of value? What, what was an important reason for oh. mentorship? That was the question, the answer I was looking for. <laughs> we had a lot of other reasons, yes. Mentoring. That was one of the reasons that drove me to raise the questions with Kurt and Tim and Jill. What do we do and how do we make sure the feedback loop is there? Go find a mentor when you're out there. Senior manager or just another sales guy or somebody in consulting or, or something that knows the organization and knows what you can do and how to get things done. I had a, uh, one of those, those stories. I developed, well, as I sort of said, I really was always doing new stuff. It was great fun, but that was really tough. You know, you're, you're set up to fail. <laughs> um, you're living on the edge, no matter what it is, even, even later on. I developed one system because we needed sales reporting. And it was to be online. Online wasn't really a thing back then. We didn't have a central server even to put stuff on for everybody else to look at. So that was a challenge in itself. And I'm no tech, techie person. But one of those, it was so successful. And quite honestly, not just to my credit, but the reason was, what did people need out of the system? That's pretty basic. You know, you ask them, well, it's online, and it was for salespeople, it was for portfolios, for customers, customer names, and the revenues you had from them, because your raise was based on this. So you're outside that comfort zone. I didn't know what to do, but I'll go do it. Sure, we need it, and I'll do it. I'm a salesperson. Now I'll be a techie person and go do this, okay. So I did that, it was superb. The, the system lasted over 10 years, 11 years in the bank. And that was remarkable given the politics of, oh, get rid of so-and-so's system, let's use mine, 
or use a different one. The, the point here is, though, a little while later, we had change of management, and I'm there at a cocktail reception. Well, I'm going to go introduce myself to the new executive, executive business person for our whole group. That's my boss's 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 boss. And so, yeah, my name's Omer Voss, yeah, and I'm, I'm, hi, well, I'm, yeah, I'm working on this, and, oh, yeah, I know, yeah, that system, and you're, you're the guy, yeah, you developed that. Oh, you know, your, your boss rolled that out to us a couple of weeks ago, right? I said, yeah, yeah, he says, why didn't you? Huh? <laughs> and it's sort of this awkward pause, I, 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 and she just looked at me and she said, think about it. And she walked away. That was a little tough mentoring and I'd been around a little while, but damn, yeah. Why didn't I? Why didn't I get my face out there? Hmm. That was a tough one. But I took her advice. And so I trained folks in Asia from San Francisco online, which had never been done, showed them how this thing could be used, how useful it was, and I pat myself on the back. This was good. I had the boss's boss's boss saying, why didn't I do this? Funny thing, the manager in Asia said, hey, that's neat, like your system, but can I use this to train my people? This is this, this video link stuff and, and, and demo, and this is great. I, I got people in Australia as well as Singapore. Can you show me how to do that? Oh, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I can do that. Set myself up to succeed accidentally, and for a whole different reason, he was interested in training his people. I was interested in sell him, selling him to use my product. Uh, you never know where an opportunity is going to come up, okay? Is really my point there. It wasn't that I'd done good all the time. Um, my last job there was in... <laughs> Another one of those cases. When I was in, in Chicago, we sort of got started on maybe some bankruptcy things. We had a few clients that needed that. And, hey, Omer, would you sort of monkey with that? Well, that ended up about six things down on my list. So I got to California. Da, 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 da. Along comes the recession and leading up to that. Hey, Omer, yeah, you're, you're doing good stuff out here in, in selling and da, 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 and these systems things. How about you go run a bankruptcy group? Huh? <laughs> okay. Who, who else? Oh, it's just you. Me. For the whole bank. Bank of America. Okay. Yeah. Well, about that time, if you remember, WorldCom and Enron and some of those names were hitting. Um... Okay, me, myself, and I'll go do that. Oh, God, now what? Spend a few hours making checklists. What do you do first? Do some research. Get your facts. Get prepared. I did all this kind of stuff. Um, that ended up with, we had, what, 14 people? I got, a, I got an analyst. Dumb, dumb, though. I never asked, okay, what resources do I have? You know, be prepared you never know when it's going to come. It was too late the next day, really. When you take it, you take it. Okay, boss. Well, shame on my boss for not saying, what resources do you need, Omer? What do you think this will do? Come back to me tomorrow with some... You know, that sort of thing. The, the, how do you lead a bankruptcy group? Well, as soon as word got out, we had a bankruptcy group. Boom, oh, oh, the phones start reading, ringing. Everybody on the line wants to get rid of that client because the revenues are going to go down. They're going to lose it on their portfolio. This is selfish stuff. You know, I'd rather take that hit off, get it off my portfolio at my boss's blessing there and send it to Omer. Well, that's fine. What they didn't know, and I wasn't going to tell them, is that that client comes into my group, we raise their pricing to full price. They actually get higher revenue. Yeah, they might leave the bank, but if we do our job right, we'll help that company stay with us. An opportunity to prove yourself. Oh, great, you know, I, I can do this. Um, it turned out we had 14 people. 
around the country, actually East Coast, West Coast, because the time zones, when people declare bankruptcy, it's, you know, suddenly it's on a Friday. Yeah, it's a good accounting day. Yeah, uh, end of the month, that's a good time. We'll, we'll pick that date. Oh, dummies. That's when the payroll goes out for salaried and hourly. And guess what? We're going to stop all your checks. What? What? You can't do that. You get all these CFOs yelling at you. This is where courage and all that stuff goes really full blast. Because you've got their attorneys on the line, too. And you're fighting with attorneys who are supposedly pretty good at this and getting paid $1,000 an hour. Well, it's fine, but guess what? You tell a company, yeah, you're bankrupt. You're dead. Okay. Well, yeah, but we can still do the payroll, right? You know, we got director's checks in there. Uh-uh, those are stopped too. So it's the kind of thing that you're not quite prepared for. How do you go reach down? I tell you what, if you haven't done it, or if you haven't had the chance, you know, take an acting class. Learn some of those things about yourself that maybe you're not comfortable doing. You've sort of never done. Maybe you've been in chorus or something before. Maybe you did play the lead in high school. Eh, give it a shot. Only because you need, as you were saying here earlier, a little flair, a little something to re be remembered by, practicing your lines, standing in front of a mirror, being poised, all those kinds of things that just help you as a person. And some of that is leadership, okay? Um, little things in sales. You know, I guess I had said, I came in here a day ahead of time. Why to be prepared? Stay in my comfort zone. Am I comfortable here? Do I know where I'm gonna park tomorrow? Oh God, what if I'm late? I oversleep. Oh yep, okay, put two alarm clocks in the suitcase. Little things like that. If you're out on a sales call, you know, little things. That's the business cards. Have them in your pocket. Have something ready. Don't fumble. Be prepared. Think through your visit. Think through your meeting. You're going to have an agenda. And I got like six pages here, and I haven't even looked at half of this. The point is there, go through... Be prepared. Think through those steps. And don't do something different that morning. Don't take a different pill. Don't you know, try to adjust your tie with your gut wet hands. You know, all those things will happen to you. One young lady I took out on her first consulting call with me. She was my little protege here. And it was great. I was mentoring. Well, I'm supposed to at least. Later she confessed. She said, Omar, I was putting on a pantyhose that morning. I had three pairs with me and I put a hole through every one of them. <laughs> like, huh? You what? I wasn't even, I, would, you know, I wouldn't think about a pantyhose, no. Uh, but I thought about, you know, flashback. I spilled on a tie and, you know, nice lunch, nice little piece of steak, and, you know, with all that au jus sitting there. Well, naturally, plop, splat. You got sales calls the rest of the day. What do you do? Well, maybe have an extra tie in your briefcase. Little stuff, you know, that make you feel comfortable when you're outside your comfort zone. Um, it's not really leadership in a way, but when you're out there on the line... People want to poke holes at you, just like amalgated sugar or rank McNally, whatever they are. I actually wrote in one study there were significant savings were possible. The guy jumped across the desk at me when I read that. Significant? What do you mean significant? Oh, well, that was just an adjective because we found a few things that you can save on. God, you know, next time I wrote a study... Didn't say significant unless I had the dollars right next to it. Little things that are there. I mean, this, this is sort of practical insight maybe on how to do stuff, like proof your term papers and have your footnotes and all that kind of stuff in order. Um, what are some other kinds of things? I've, 
What, what questions might you have? I hear snoring in the back row here. No, not, not quite yet. Seriously, what, what things about just experiences or, yeah. My biggest challenges? Early on, we see we've got to refine this. That's a good question. <laughs> um, early on was just having the guts to step up. You know, this growing up in England and such and so forth, that was a lot of, um, how shall we say, diplomacy. I said rather and quite, and I say and actually. You know, a lot of that was in my background of, you know, the stiff upper lip and all that sort of British stuff. So I grew up in that kind of a context. Didn't come until high school into here. Um, yeah, I had the leg up because I started algebra and Latin and French at nine years old. But did I know how to play football? No, I played rugby. I was a star. I was just a big, big kid. But also, I was the only American in that school. And he sort of got picked on. Because the Brit British kids didn't exactly like me. The parents liked the Americans still after the war. But the point is, how did that affect my behavior? Yeah, I was a bit of a wallflower. I was a diplomat. Well, if you're going to be a diplomat, you better be prepared. So I was always worried about having all the, I wasn't really going to run out there. So to your, your question, what challenges, when I got through college and all of that stuff, yeah, and then became a whiz in grad school, I finally reached my stride. God, that took a long time. And then got into business, and then I fell flat again. I knew it should be done, but how to do it. I couldn't implement. I couldn't collaborate. I didn't have all those skills. You have to practice those, but you can do some of that yourself. So that challenge, I would, I would say the biggest challenge was doing that. Later on, I had some stature. I had to build a team. That was a challenge. How do you build a team from zero? How do you pick the people? How do you set it up? How do you give them the resources? How do you give them the checklists? Now, the salespeople wanted the, you know, the company just went bankrupt. What do we do? What do we do? Fine, you write a checklist. Have some of those kinds of things. If you're going to lead something, be prepared to lead it. Or at least come back the next day and say it. What other kinds of questions? Yes? So what was it that made me want to create grad the value program, or at least augment what goes on now? Um, what else can I say, Dad? In some ways, and this is sort of self-confession, <laughs> and I alluded to it in my, my, my words this morning, um, when he was saying, you know, we have to find a way to train leaders, to teach them, to help them overcome their reluctance. And I sort of said, sometimes he glanced at me, so I wasn't sure whether I was in the leader or the non-leader group. You know, what's he thinking? What was motivating him? Well, he'd seen it out in business, and he'd seen it in the church. He would said he'd wanted to grab some of these pastors by the lapels and shake them. Don't you know how to preach? Didn't they teach you that? Yeah, you're a good theologian. You got a soft ear. Do you know how to manage a church, an organization where you train to be a CEO? You know, so there's lots of those examples, but I think back, gee, was he also thinking about me? I was a smart kid. But I fell flat in my face early on. And if that happens, I could have maybe been executive vice president instead of senior vice president. 
get that earlier start. Well, and also, I was in the Navy, you know, Vietnam. You know, you think about you couldn't drop a course because you had to have 30 hours a year. Otherwise, you got drafted. So you had to stay in that class once you picked it or go to summer school. So you couldn't get a job in summer school to pay for your college education. Uh -uh. And then you also got to pay for summer and apartments and whatever, whatever. So tremendous pressures then. Otherwise, you go be cannon fodder in the jungle. Didn't want to do that. So I ended up in the Navy anyway. But the uh, point is that that opportunity and stepping out, learning some things, coming back, being a straight A student, all that kind of stuff, ended up, gee, I'm, I'm gonna hit the road running here, and next thing you know, you fall flat in your face. Or, and I shouldn't say that, I was pretty good at some things, but the point is, I could have been better and that's what your faculty here is doing, Jill, Kurt, and all of them, Christy, everybody. It's getting you to practice things, learn stuff. There's book learning, yeah. But then with value, it came, what can you do to reach down and do this stuff? Practice it so you don't fall on your face when you get out there. So you got the confidence just to step up and say, oh, I can do it. Because everybody else around that table is probably going to be, oh, God, I hope they don't pick on me for that. Hey, you can be a hero to those people, too. But at the same time, they might wish they had stepped up. And you did, so now they're going to be laying for you. <laughs> no, nah, there's a little human behavior there, baby. But, you know, take that role and, and simply give it a shot. Okay, that's... Ask a simple question, you get a pageant sometimes, okay? Um, some other pieces of, how, how about these days entrepreneurs? How would you see leadership and entrepreneurship combined? Any budding entrepreneurs in the crowd? How would you lead some entrepreneurs. Might be a little different from the book learning. Maybe the same principles, but you got to adjust your tactics, maybe. Probably hit a whole bunch as soon as you said part of it, everything else followed. And uh, soon other folks heard enough of that. Point is, yeah, you could be herding cats, you know, as they say, um, getting things done through volunteers if you're in the community. I heard community mentioned before. How do you get things done with volunteers? Some are eager, they always want to be out front and no. Uh, yeah, but suddenly they've got other things to do. It's difficult to do things with volunteers. It's difficult to manage entrepreneurs. Just it's a different mindset. For example, I mean, the classic one, I was in engineering as an undergrad, so internship. I saw them make a mistake where the company appointed their best engineer to be their manager of engineering. Oh boy, that was great. You know, he got a promotion and all this stuff. He's get to be manager. I'm seeing head shake. Uh-uh. Make that guy your chief engineer. Give him the attaboys he or she deserves. But get a manager in to manage those engineers. That kind of thing is important to think who that audience is. I didn't know what my audience was here today. I sort of had a rough idea what it was this morning, but I wasn't quite sure about this, this event. I hope it doesn't show too badly. But the point is, 
if you pick or are picked, you know, that's an opportunity to lead. Maybe engineers don't want that, some do. And some are very capable and could fill both jobs, chief engineer. Other folks in sales, they're great salespeople, lousy manager of sales. Got, they got great customer stuff. They love being on the road. They love da 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 da. But don't pick them to be your manager. 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 Manager.
senior management is totally overpaid with all the platinum parachutes, not even gold ones anymore. Point is, you got paid a lot of money at the top because you took the fall. That's why you got paid and you had the responsibility and accountability. You know, some things you can delegate, some you can't. You got to take that ownership. And I think that was one of the downfalls with Harvester because here's the outside guy, going to take it over, got a strike. Didn't like unions. Well, let's just hold their feet to the fire. Nah, 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 nah. Well, they did, and it cost, basically it cost Harvester its leadership. And eventually the gentleman left. And at the funeral, a lot of folks were there, and I heard it from people who'd come visit, I mean, long before that. But a guy came up to me, introduced himself, he says, you know, biggest mistake Harvester ever made was not making your dad president and chairman, just CEO. I said, boy, that's nice to hear. And he would have liked to have heard that, but he knew it because he knew what ran the company down. And a lot of retirees, the same thing. You know, they had stock options, whatever. Hell, I had stock options at Bank of America, and its stock went from 60 to 2. Got nothing. So if nothing else, plan your nest eggs. <laughs> um, but uh, Kurt, to your, to your point, I think it was, Dad always followed some folks cleaning up messes and then advancing and they were doing that in the new team at Harvester when it was, well, let's bring in someone from the outside. And you need to shake things up, believe me. Old, the old guard wasn't that great. But bringing in the new and not, I think the new person made the mistake of not learning from the old folks about the business. You know, farm tractors and such and trucks and even in the company, the truck people didn't really talk to the farm equipment people. So was it the, the new CEO wasn't really diagnosing what was going on, really didn't learn the, the, the culture first, didn't learn the business first before making change? No. Nope. No. Nope. It was what's on the reports, what's on paper, what's the computer runs. I mean, not. I mean, this guy was very talented, clearly. I mean, uh, and I don't mean to run him down that way. Good executive in some other role, perhaps. Uh, to come in and shake something up is good. You see, you see it all the time. And it costs jobs, it costs this and that. You don't make friends when you come in from the outside. And you're not supposed to. But you gotta do it smart. You have to learn, do your preparation. So if you're coming in at any level, whatever it might be, when I say prepare, I mean think it through. Think step by step. If you're going on a business trip, think it through. How many calls you're going to make? What's the schedule? How to do it? I mean, those kinds of things. It's leadership on your own as opposed to leadership with your team around you all the time. Because these days your team won't be around you. You'll have a couple people and the rest of them are scattered everywhere. How do you manage people at a distance? How do you, you got to talk to them. You have to be on the phone with them. You have to be in front of them. And then your boss cuts your, cuts your travel budget. I mean, that's, that's real world reality. Um, I, I, I want to be mindful of your time here too. Um, some other kinds of questions, please. Oh, yeah. Good point. Um, and was talking with, with Kurt and Jill earlier this morning. Kurt was talking about making change in organization and, and being persuasive. Um, one of my <clears throat> early summer interns was with some engineers. And one of the things they said <clears throat> was to, they had some quality control was what their role was. And their saying was, at every road that leads to the future, there are a thousand men to guard the past. And that's sort of true. Change. It's uncomfortable, right? If you're going to lead change, that's part of what leaders do. They don't just manage the 
status quo. You can't just do that. You're, if you're coming into a new job, well, what are you going to change? Oh, we're going to cut the budget by 10%. We're going to do this, yada, yada. We're going to have the vision. We're going to have yeah. uh, quit parroting back management stuff. What are you really going to do? And what happens is, I, I guess the, the challenge is to get the facts, get, get people on your team or on your side, at least know their position. When I've had, I was called in after I developed a product. Whoopee, it was great. I was sort of back room then, okay? And the salesperson had called me out to New York, who was front of the Pittman company. And these were old line printer guys, you know, more cigar chomping, sleeves are rolled up. Go in a room and it was, you know, half the size of this with 100 of these guys in there. They've been in there for two days. The salesperson that brought me in was a bitch. She wanted to have an expert in there. She didn't want to take the fall. Uh uh uh. And this was her client. So you do good, Omer. Oh, God, yeah, all right. Yeah. And I was scared. I didn't know what, you know, but I had the facts, I knew the product. Sat back two days before I went, hmm, how am I going to present this? I didn't know who this audience was, didn't know a thing, had all the facts and figures and all that, but how do you spin it right? There's a term called spin selling, by the way. You may run into that at some point. But um, anyhow, so went in there, thought about who these people were ahead of time and probably did the best sales job anybody could have done. Didn't know it at the time. After the words, this gal came up to me and said, my God, Omar, I didn't know you were that good. Why aren't you in sales? I don't know. I was just in product. Sort of like when the executive came up to me and said, well, why didn't you present it? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> didn't think I could, should. No, I didn't, I didn't persist. I didn't bang on the table with my boss and say, no, that's my, my product. I want to go out and present that. I didn't step up to the product manager and say, I want to go out to New York and sell this first product with crazy lady. No. I should have, could have. I uh, didn't quite feel comfortable doing that. So that's, I don't know if that really answers the question, but... There's all kinds of situations like that. And go pick the toughest one. I didn't make buddies with the salesperson. I admired her. She got results. She was wonderful, very good at it, but wasn't real kind to the people that she was around. So you really didn't want to go out on a call with her. On the other hand, you could learn a lot from her, and I did. Um, sort of those kinds of things, if you will. Um, OK. Crazy little sales tales and such. A lot, a lot of this goes back to sales, but in a way, leadership is sales, isn't it? I mean, that's what you're doing. You're selling other people in the company. If you're at the top, down, getting your facts, getting your team. One of the things that Dad was very good at doing as a debater was, well, think about, again, those skills. You know, this is one-off stuff. You get out there, and as a coach, he told me the tale about Willie, um, who is a great debater in a sense. He, he did all the prep, everything, everything. It was the delivery. He was just sort of a you know, little milk toast about it and whatever, but he was had all this. He was, boy, he was just boop, boop, boop on the facts. And I remember a pop, he said, well, damn it, get out there, and pound on the table, make your point. Apparently, he couldn't do that very well, so he coached him, and he did. Those little kinds of things. Don't go pounding on your boss's desk, but get that excitement into things. You know, get, get energized. You're sitting in class, reading textbooks, listening to me ramble on and whatever it might be, but think about, well, what are you going to do next? You have a term paper due. Or you've got uh, you know, some meeting coming up, whatever that might be. Think about it and think how you can go, force yourself, 
outside of your comfort zone? What if somebody wanted to publish that paper? I wrote some articles as an engineer. I got an engineer writing art, and they got published. We sent this thing out to China, Russia, all over the place. This was back in the you know, 60s. We got responses. Might be because I sent my letter back, too, with every flag or whatever on every stamp on there that had the Liberty Bell and all this kind of stuff on the stamps. But the point was, you never know where that audience is. So think about where things might go. Yeah, the trouble you could get in. But that was what's fun. You go learn from that. Just don't trip up your own people. You know, help them, guide them, mentor them. And when you're on the team down at this level, understand who can help on that team and see if you could lead it next time. You never know. Or the study group. Or a marketing project. You know, nobody really wants to, although some might. Well, you be that one that wants to, okay? Thoughts? I've running, running on, and I can't hold the mic and flip pages, so you're lucky. <laughs> Jill, time to quit? Okay. I just want to say on behalf of the Department of Leadership Studies in Fort Hayes State University, we thank you so much for sharing your experiences and your wisdom and uh, encouraging all of us in the room to, to get out of our comfort zone because that's where true leadership can happen. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you.